All right, everybody. Hello. Ah. Sorry I'm a bit late. The train derailed. Oh, just a second. I try to dress nicely for these things whenever I can, so... Alright, let me get to my comment section. Um, my channel. Alright, who's here? We got Eternal Travels, Haley. Um, and by the way, everybody always asks on every stream, but what's that loud noise? It is the kettle heating up the water. Um, hello, Haley. Hello, Tyler. Hello, Justin. Hello, Pookie Smoochie. Hello, Kevin. Eternal Travel says, currently working on a Queen Mary docuseries, waiting for the stream to start. Awesome. Tyler Frederick says, oh, wait, hold on. Darn these ads. Necessary evil. All right, let's see. Um... Where was... Oh, Tyler says, I know you don't like ocean liners after World War II, but what do you think of SS Andrea Doria? I don't have an opinion on Andrea Doria. I really don't know much about it. Um, Ryan says, hi, from Florida at Disney World on the way to dinner. We'll miss the show. We'll talk later in the replay. Okay, awesome. Have fun at Disney World. Um... Oh, Ken is here, but he's leaving. All right. Thanks for tuning in, Ken. Good to see you. Um, Kevin asks, what do you think about the German ocean liner SS Imperator? I don't know much about it. Um, yeah, so as you can see, I, I have my, my ON30 scale train behind me. <laughs> And I was setting it up today. I was rearranging the cars and everything, and and uh, I was gonna run the other locomotive that I nicknamed Mr. Squeaky because it is so squeaky. Um, but today it was squeakier than ever, and I'm actually kind of afraid that it might be grinding away at whatever metal is in there. So I decided I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna buy a, a special electrically conductive lubricant that will work specifically for the the locomotives and then just see if that works hopefully it doesn't create any new issues in the future but um yeah but anyway what ended up happening was i'm using the smaller locomotive i forgot to switch one of the tracks back to the way i normally have it and what happened was as that little train was coming around this way it actually went on the other track where the passenger cars are resting and it actually slammed into the passenger cars which kind of derailed them and derailed it. So <laughs> had to fix that right at the moment it was time to go live. Um, all right. PDR Studio says, I just hung up three ocean liner pictures. Please respond and do you remember me from the 50K stream? I do remember you from the 50K stream. Uh, Emperor of Water. Lou says, good afternoon, Alex. Nice outfit. Which tea are you having this time? Today, I am having Lady Grey. I don't have this one too often. It's a very, very light tea. Um, it smells I, It smells way better than it tastes. <laughs> that doesn't mean it tastes bad. It just doesn't taste like it smells. Yeah, I often describe this as as kind of like a like lemons on a rainy day. It's a very nice smell, but uh, it doesn't taste that way. So, um, but I am having it because I do have a whole box of it and I need to finish it off. So um, it's time to pre-warm the teapot, or the tea kettle, I mean, teapot, whatever. Have to empty out half of it. It's a hot day today. Today it's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
outside, but in my apartment with my new air conditioner, it is only 75 degrees. It's not bad. Oh, I knew I was forgetting something. I need to get the McVitie's out. Today's sandwich is a English egg salad sandwich. So it's prepared just the same way that, um, that Eng English uh, tea sandwiches are, are made. So they're little finger sandwiches similar recipe normally they use watercress i don't have access to watercress up here like i don't know if it's just like a uk thing i'm not sure but um but uh what i did have was i had extra dill left over fresh dill so i decided to chop that up and put that in there it's really good good substitute if you don't have watercress um okay so those are gonna preheat a little bit this is authentic china from the ocean liners, such as RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth, um, and uh, they, because they are authentic China, they do need to be pre-warmed, or else if you just pour straight up boiling water in them without bringing up the temperature, uh, they will crack from thermal shock. All right, now I'm going to go grab the McVitie's, because I forgot to put them on here. So for those of you wondering, McVitie's, I get them in packs, as you can see I've already gone through the whole pack, but this is the last package. They are, it says milk chocolate digestives, but they're, they're basically little um, tea biscuits, and uh, they're really quite good. Oh, jeez. The first one is broken to pieces. I'm actually pretty surprised because normally there's way more that are broken. All right. I'll leave that for a second. Right, I'm back. So, yeah, so they're basically chocolate covered um, tea biscuits. They're really delicious, but they're they're really expensive when you import them here in the United States. Each of those packages I showed you is about seven U.S. dollars, sometimes up to eight U.S. dollars. And even though I buy them in a pack of four of those. Um, it still divides up to seven or eight dollars per pack and people tell me that when they live in the UK you know they're two dollars per pack so or you know or not even the UK but Australia someone said last time Australia it was two Australian dollars I was just like that is nice and cheap these are expensive luxuries here it's the same thing with the Scottish shortbread I used to buy Walker's guard uh, Scottish shortbread they're quite expensive here in the U.S., so I make my own. I make my own here. Um, I occasionally make crumpets as well. I make that homemade here in the house because those are actually very, e e very easy to make. Um, crumpets are really just like the same kind of production as pancakes, although they don't taste like pancakes at all or hot cakes wherever you're from. So, yes. All right, let's get back to comments. I can feel that the the China's coming up to temperature nicely. Um, hello, Scott. Hello, Mordog. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Jack's Ship's Adventures. Hello, Dead Jeb. Hello, Brocky. Hello, Logan. Vivid Racer, how's it going? 
Um, Ivan says, hi, Alex. Sorry if I haven't tuned in a little busy. Curious if you're, if you're still going to release the Spruce Goose vid video. Every two streams you ask me that, Ivan, the answer is always still the same. Yes, I intend to, but I can't give you a scheduled date because there's still videos I have to make before I get to that. So, um, you know, it is a lot of research to, to do a Spruce Goose video. I have all the footage I need. Um, I filmed the Spruce Goose inside and out. I went all the way around it. I, I filmed all over it. I got tons of 4K footage of the, the Spruce Goose, but it will take me time to produce that, and I haven't even started yet because I, I still have a few other videos to make before that. So, yes, the answer is still yes. Um, let's see. Jack's Ships Adventures say, I've seen the Queen Mary 2. Awesome. I want to take a trip aboard the Queen Mary 2 someday. Um... Daniel Mary says, Alex, do you think the, do you believe the Southern Pacific 4449 is the Queen Mary of the rails? I don't know much, much about the 4449, so I couldn't really say. Um, Empire of Waterloo says, ah, oh, I love Lady Grey. It's so good with the Bergamo. Yeah, it really is. Hello, Mark. How's it going? Toet says, which one do you like more, the bow or stern of ocean liners? I never really thought of it that way. Um, because I, I don't really favor those parts of ocean liners. Um, but, I mean, if I had to choose between... The, my favorite part of an ocean liner being either the bow or the stern. I would say the bow. Mm. Vivid Racer says, Hi Alex, what is your favorite ship from the Hamburg America line? I don't know any. Uh, Granny Gaming says, Hello. Is today a fancy day? Um, well, I try to wear a jacket whenever it's cool enough in the house to do it. Because up until a couple days ago, I didn't have an air conditioner. We've been going through heat wave after heat wave. And so um, I couldn't put on layers. It was just too hot. Like I think like the hottest it got in the house was 95 or 96 degrees Fahrenheit. Which, I mean, I don't know what that translates to to celsius um but it's really hot you know especially for inside a house so i i often if you don't see me wearing a jacket it's because it's too hot in the house to do it but i have an air conditioner now so it actually is a very comfortable temperature in here um, but it is really hot outside it's a hundred and 101 degrees outside John Shirisky says, Hi, Alex. The digestive's name sounds so med medicinal. Yeah, I know. It really does, doesn't it? Um, but that's why people just call them, like, you know, biscuits. Because, you know, really, the, it's the, it's probably a better name than digestive's. Um, Mark says, We have a product here called Scone Loaf, which looks like a loaf of bread, but it's a scone mix divine with butter and honey. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, Doc says, new subscriber, love your videos. The history ones have great ASMR quality. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, oh, I need to bring that back up to a boil. Um, yeah, you know, I, I really have this specific vision for how I do my history videos. You know, I grew up watching the History Channel, and back when I was a kid, they actually did history on the History Channel instead of just looking for mythical creatures or ghosts. But um, but when I was a kid, they used to do, like, history on the History Channel. 
And the way that they used to tell the stories wasn't just like a matter of fact kind of way. They did it with showmanship. They had, it was an entertainment factor. And they kind of took the history, found a little story in it, and then told the history through that story. And I liked how they did that. And you don't really see that too often anymore. Everything is usually just given to you in like a bullet point format. And that's okay, um, but I still crave some of those things where you can tell a story. And I feel like people learn things better through that kind of storytelling process. And um, I'd like to think my videos are really good at teaching people those things. Okay. That's good. I have to let that cool down a few degrees because straight boiling water is too hot for the for this particular tea. I'm going to preheat this again. So I'll give that a minute or two to cool down before I put the tea in there. Um, let's see. Pookie Smoochie says, do you ever get tired of answering the same question? I do, but I always try to remind myself that, you know, there are new people here who didn't, who don't know that, that they're asking the same questions that other people have been asking. Um, and then there's some people here who don't remember that they're asking the same questions that they've been asking. Um, you know, that a lot of, a lot of the questions that get repeated to me are often things like, what do you think would happen if the Titanic didn't sink? Or what do you think would have happened if White Star Line had more ships than Cunard during the merger? Or, you know, or... You know, do you think that uh, they'll ever bring pieces of the Titanic back up? Those are like the three most frequently asked questions on my live streams. Um, and those ones, I don't even know how to answer them anymore. I used to say, I used to try to answer them, but now they get asked so frequently now, I don't, I don't answer them because the answer is always the same. I don't talk about Titanic you know, on my channel because people, there is, so there's the ocean liner community and then there's the Titanic community and the Titanic community, they're kind of overlapping into the ocean liner community, but they're a very specific group of people made up of thousands and thousands of people. And each one of them has their own idea of the correct facts that happened to Titanic or the correct facts that determine the future of Titanic's wreck. So all of them, each one of them have their own understanding of things. And when I come in and I tell the story or I try to teach a fun fact or something, every single one of them will come in with a, well, actually, because they all have different ideas, different accounts, different sources of information. And they all think that they're the ones that have the correct information. You know, maybe the information I give is incorrect and that sometimes is the case. You know, I am human. Um, but uh, it is one of those things where I learned very early on doing ocean liner content that I wanna steer clear of anything related to Titanic or the Olympic class ships. Um, simply because there are people who can run circles around me with their information um, and I'll never, I'll never, never be able to satisfy their need for Titanic content. I mean, that's just, it, that's just blatantly obvious. I will never be able to satisfy their need for Titanic content. And I don't think I want to. So there's a lot of other ocean liners out there that are less known than Titanic that I kind of want to delve into, you know, and there's plenty of, you know, there's plenty of people 
who know Titanic very well, who have channels and do Titanic really well, you know, chief among them, you know, are people like um, Sam from Historic Travels. You got um, Titanic Honor and Glory, Titanic University. You know, you've got um, Ocean Liner Designs. You know, those those folks they know Titanic really well, and they produce a lot of really great content. We don't need another person producing content that maybe isn't up to that that par. So I try to stick to other lesser known ocean liners and Queen Mary because of all the ocean liners I know about, I know more about Queen Mary than the rest of them. And there, before I started making Queen Mary videos, there really wasn't anything on YouTube quite like that. You know, there was like, people occasionally told like a, a rehashed retelling of Queen Mary's history, but no one really dove into the details you know, someone actually said um, a couple months ago, and I thought it was a, a really good uh, comparison. You know, I'm like the historic travels of the Queen Mary, because historic travels, he delves into the details of Titanic and its history. I tend to delve into the details of Queen Mary and its history. So I thought that was kind of a really good comparison. So that's kind of what I do on this channel. I've only been into ocean liners for a little over two years now. I'm still very new to it. I've been into trains and Disneyland history and history of various cities and things long before I was an ocean liner fan. So, um, so up until this point, I've been doing other kinds of content. And once I started doing ocean liners, I get a lot of questions about ocean liners, people asking me about SS Imperator, people asking me about Andrea Doria. I know the basic stories. I know Andrea Doria, you know, it's basic story. Um, but I don't know much. Like, I can't picture these liners in my head. If someone says SS Imperator, I can't picture SS Imperator in my head. So when people say, what do you think of SS Imperator? I go, I couldn't tell you because it's not in my head. I don't have like a like an image in my head and be able to say, oh, well, I think it's more beautiful than this, or I think it's less beautiful than that, or, you know, or anything like that. So I don't know it enough is basically what I'm saying. So um, it does lead to a lot of frequently asked questions um, because people really want to know more. They want to know my opinions on things. And I'm still new. I'm still very new to all of this. And it takes a long time to research. Um, the kind of research I do, time to put this in. We'll do four minutes, so 4.30. So the kind of research I do, you know, I try not to just be one of those people who, like, checks on Wikipedia. I, I really find articles. I delve deep into books. You know, I spend weeks making my videos. And it, it must look easy to people because some people, they... Most of them are, are, are really just um, trolls, you know, and of course everybody knows you ignore trolls, but, you know, that aside, um, some people think that the vi these videos are so easy to make. They go, oh, well, why don't you just make more? And I'm, I'm like, because it takes weeks and weeks to make them, you know, they're, they're very complex things, you know, and doing the research, and it's about to get even more complicated because... Um, because next month I'm going to be upgrading a lot of the equipment I have in order to produce better videos. Like I'm going to get a new microphone and, and, um, and because I often have trouble, uh, the microphone I have picks up too much sound from around the apartment. And uh, I, need an, uh, I need this new microphone, which is very good at isolating the sound of my voice. And then there's other things like uh, I'm going to be getting a software that will convert really low quality vintage footage into 4k images um and that's something i've never done before uh but i want that software because i like to make 4k videos you know i want in i you know 10 years from now i want people to be able to look back on my videos and not feel like oh this is the early days of youtube you know i want it to be polished and look nice years to come and one of those ways is not displaying low quality pixelated images on my videos. I want to avoid it if I can. So there's this software that can that can um, convert footage and photos into 4K images and it looks very good for what it is. 
So, um, so I'm going to be doing stuff like that, you know. Um, and that'll just make the process for making videos a little bit longer. But I think ultimately the quality will be really good and it'll look nice. So, yeah. So, yes, to answer your question, Pookie Smoochie, uh, I do occasionally get tired of the same questions. <laughs> um, let's see. Marco says, I'm currently on Route 66 just seeing the Muffler Man. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've heard about Muffler Man. Uh, let's see. Granny Gaming says, what kind of snacks are you eating this time? I have, um, I have uh, an English style um, egg salad sandwich cut into fingers. I have my usual Scottish shortbread that I make here at home, and I have McVitie's Digestives. New train this time. No, same train. I haven't bought any new equipment in years for this railroad. So it's all the same stuff. Um, I just rearranged it, that's all. Um, M. Brocky says, when will the next Queen Mary video come out? I'm not sure. Um... You know, a video... I was working on an Ocean Liner video. And... I think it's important for me to say that... The way I do my videos... Is... I can't just... Pick a subject and start making a video on it. My brain doesn't work that way. I do my best videos when the inspiration catches hold of me. When I feel like this is something that's going to be pouring out of my fingers and onto the keys of my keyboard. And that's when my best videos come out. And lately, while I have tons of videos I could make stuff on already, there was nothing this week that was really jumping off the page for me. And, um, and then I was, I came across some research about New Orleans and I thought, you know what, this will make a really great video. And that's what my mind latched onto this week. So, um, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'll be making a video first, uh, about the French Quarter in New Orleans. And, um, so sometimes that happens. I ha I was already working on a video about the vibrations that shake that or shook ocean liners in the past um because a lot of you have heard about how certain ocean liners like the queen mary um like mauritania shook rather violently because of various factors and people often attribute it to one factor their propellers or people often attribute it to another factor their engines but in actuality there was a, quite a few factors that led to the ocean liners vibrating so uncomfortably um, and so I wanted to kind of cover that topic, but, you know, I finished writing the narration, I voiced the narration, I have it all recorded, and I was going to start working on the video, but then I kind of lost interest, and then what happens, what I, what I do when that happens is I wait till my interest in it comes back, and then I continue making the video, because if, believe me, I have tried, I have in the past, I have pushed through and completed a video that I didn't feel like making. And when that happens, I do a really bad job at it. Uh, the video often comes off as boring and uninspired. So I, ever since I ruined a video once by doing that, I decided that never again was I going to make a video when I didn't feel like making a video. I instead have to look for something else that will capture my attention until I can come back to that subject. So I still intend to keep making, you know, ocean liner videos and Queen Mary videos, but at this very moment in time, I'm really stuck on this subject about the French Quarter, and I want to get this video out while I still have interest in it, and then I'll go back into maybe finishing my, um, my video about why ocean liners vibrated so uncomfortably, um, and then maybe afterwards I will get into the Spruce Goose video. So 
We will see. So I know that's probably something you guys haven't heard before. You've probably never heard of someone only working on something when the inspiration takes them. Um, but that's when my best videos are made, honestly. Um, that's why my channel, that's why you guys love my channel so much, is because I make the videos when I'm suddenly very taken with the information. So, um, yeah, that's what I do. All right. So, a little bit of sugar. And today's tea is Lady Grey tea, in case I didn't mention it. And with Lady Grey tea, I don't like to have it with milk. I just put a little bit of sugar in it. Which is a good thing for me today, because that's one less dish I have to wash. <laughs> which is the, the milk pitcher, I, you know. It's a lot of stuff to wash afterwards. So... <laughs> More Dog says, On either the 20th or 21st of August, I'm heading to a model train show, and I think I'm going to get my second model train. Oh, really cool. Awesome. Yeah, model train shows are really good for buying new train stuff, because uh, some of the folks will sell what they have, and they'll, they'll make it very cheap sometimes. Hmm... Pookie Smoochie says, remember Modern Marvels on History Channel? Your channel reminds me of that show. I miss it. Yes, exactly. Modern Marvels. Yeah. That was certainly one of the shows that inspired this channel. This. Yeah. So. Doc says, yes, you're an excellent storyteller. Teaching through telling definitely works better. I'm a psychologist. I can concur that this is a great way to learn. Well, Thanks. That actually does that. That makes me feel better. It makes me feel like I'm actually doing something that is <laughs> that it, you know that is making a difference. Yeah. I mean, I I love you know making stories through storytelling. You know, and so it's kind of funny. Um, someone commented on my cable car video. They said, you know, they said something along the lines of. Oh, but there, you know, there was more to the story. You know, Frito Klusman had to, you know, had to fight for the cable cars on this time and this time and this time. And, you know, and then there was this whole issue in the 80s trying to get um, Mayor um, um, Feinstein to, uh, to rebuild the cable car system. And while I did briefly touch upon those specific subjects in my video, I kind of went over them because I... Again, I like to tell a story, and I think that's the best way people can learn. And I really, I looked at all the, the instances of each time Friel Klusman had to come back and help save the cable cars. I looked at the, the 1980 situation of rebuilding the cable car line, and I thought, you know what, these are great stories, but they're not, they don't have enough to make me need to put it in the video. Because... Really, it could be summed up as Friedel Klusman had to fight off, you know, attempts to destroy the cable cars several times. And then it could be summarized as Mayor Feinstein helped to lead, you know, a, um, a, a fight to rebuild the cable car system. And that's really what those two situations came down to. So I wanted to tell a story that had a happy ending. And... You know, and the story has to reach a climax. And the climax, I felt, was the first time the cable cars were saved, which was um, in 1947, when, um, when Friedel Klusman and the city of San Francisco had to vote whether to scrap or save the cable cars. I felt that was the turning point in history. And because that's the first time any, anybody really had to consider saving the cable cars. And so I told that story... And then I briefly touched upon the other various instances of Friedel Klusman having to help save the cable cars over the years, and then Mayor Feinstein's attempts to save the cable cars. And then I finished off with the story about, you know, what it is today and, and how it's gotten where it is. And I felt that that was a good way to tell the story because I didn't skip any facts. I just didn't elaborate on the later facts because they it, I didn't feel it was necessary. So... So when people ask how, 
you know, how are your videos a storytelling video? Well, that's one of the ways I do them. I find a, a way that the story tells itself and I still try to include all the facts that are necessary, but some facts are not necessary to elaborate on. So that's kind of how I do things. Um, Vivid Racer, yes, I've heard of the Mallard. Eternal Travel says the Titanic community is its own species. I'm somewhat of a part of that species. Yeah. Uh, Hello, Kylo. Granny Gaming says, what new mic are you going to get? Noise suppression exists. Well, yes, I do have software that does noise suppression. But noise suppression works best when you have a constant sound in the background, such as an air conditioner, right? Well, the thing is, is that I don't always have consistent sounds in the background. Um, I live next to a construction site. So, and that construction site has been there for a year already, and they probably still have another year to go. And so it's, it's constant hammering and jackhammering. And then you got the sounds of machines, you know, backing up and beeping occasionally. And it's never the same sound twice, basically. And, um, and so because of that, that sneaks into my audio. And whenever there's that much noise, I have to not work on a video. I have to stop and wait till the end of the night when they all go home so I can start recording. And sometimes I don't have time to do that at night. Um, and then another thing too is that my computer is also really loud. So it occasionally makes random computer noises. And because they're so random, it sneaks into the audio. Um, another thing too is uh, my voice tends to echo through the apartment. I have large, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, big ceilings, basically. Big ceilings. And vaulted ceilings, there we go. I have, I have vaulted ceilings in my apartment. And it leads to echoing. And yes, I know there are ways to mitigate that. You have, you know, you can put special, like, egg crate cartons and stuff on the walls. But as you can see, my apartment is designed so it looks nice during various live streams. Sometimes I live stream from the computer, which you see a different part of the apartment. Sometimes I live stream from here, so you can see this part of the apartment. And sometimes I film videos in the corner of the apartment over there where you can see that. So I can't just put all these ugly egg crates around the walls to, to lower the amount of echo that's in here. Um, so I needed something more, you know, a better solution. And so um, one of those things was getting a professional microphone. Um, it's a, uh, I forget what it's, what the brand name is, but it's an RE320. It's not a cheap piece of equipment. Um, but I am going to get it because I've been wanting it for about two years now, and I've never had the money for it until recently. Um, and so it'll really help with allowing me to record narration pretty much whenever I want to without having to worry about, you know, someone, you know, driving up in their noisy car or, you know, or like hearing hammering going on all of a sudden next door, you know, that kind of thing. So that's kind of what I do here. Daniel Ramirez says, have you ever thought about getting a ON30 mogul? Um, I have, but I'd rather have an ON3440 um, because I like those more. So um, the only thing is that ON3440s are very expensive. They can be at least $300 up to $450. 
and I don't think it's a smart idea for me to invest that much money right now in that kind of engine. Do I want a Mogul? Not really. No. Um, the layout is really too big for an engine like that. I mean, I'm sorry, no, the layout is too small for an engine that big, basically. It would just look really weird. Um, especially because I'm trying to go for a forced perspective look on this layout. I'm trying to make the landscape look larger than it really is and make the railroad look smaller than it really is so you get the sense that it's more realistic in scale but uh, in reality this is for an ON30 layout this is actually a very small layout um, KY Cat says I figure it'll be a secret but what kind of things are you planning for the French Quarter? What do you mean, my my trip to the French Quarter or my video I'm making this week about the French Quarter? I don't mind telling you, but I need to know what you're asking. <laughs> um, Granny Gaming says, how long does it take this... W how long does this one take to make? How long does what one take to make? Um... Eternal Travel says, whenever I was in school, I didn't like history class. I didn't like it because I didn't get to choose the history that I wanted to learn about. It was always about war, but outside of school, I got to choose. I agree entirely. You know, I would have never thought when I was a teenager that I actually liked history. I mean, granted, again, I used to love watching things on History Channel like Modern Marvels. And, and there was another show, like some other history show. I loved stuff like that. But when I go to school, the history that they wanted us to learn was so boring. I mean, I hate to say that about things like war. I mean, obviously people died, but but as a kid, there are other types of history that I think are more interesting. Or at least I always felt in school that there was a better way to do things, to teach kids history that they just weren't doing. I always, I was always such a weird kid. I always thought, I'd sit there in history class while the teacher droned on and on and on about, you know, world history or American history. And I'd think in my head, you know, this would be so much more interesting if they just had a little bit of showmanship, you know, to teach all this stuff. You know, um, and it was funny because I actually got a chance to do something like that. We had a project, right, where we had to take everything we learned from American history and put it into some kind of project. Um, maybe it was like a movie or something. I, I think some people did a movie. Some people did like music. Like they did like some, some one girl recorded like 12 tracks of music. Each song told the history of the United States, which was pretty cool. But in my opinion, it was still kind of boring. I had this grand idea where <laughs> the idea was I was going to make a video but the video was going to be about a theme park based on American history. And there was going to be rides. And each ride told a specific story in the chapter of American history. Each land told a specific region in American history. And, um, and it was a really cool idea. It took weeks to come up with. And then I made this video about it. And it blew everyone in the class away. Because it, I, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I honestly think that everybody thought my video was the most interesting project out of all the projects everyone presented that day. And so um, that's where, honestly, now that I think about it, that's probably where it solidified in my head that eventually when I did create a YouTube channel, which was a decade later, that that's how I was going to do things. Probably more than a decade, right? Yeah. Yeah, almost a decade later is when I would start my YouTube channel. And the first thing I decided I was gonna do was it was gonna be like really interesting videos with some showmanship to it. And that turned out to be a good formula. Um, Coco says, hey man, recently found you through the Disneyland videos. They are amazing. And your quality and attention to detail is extremely inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, those are videos I'm very particularly proud of. And there'll be more in the future, but it'll be um, infrequently, um, just because there's a lot of other content that people are here for as well. Um, 
Kylo says, this channel makes me love history more than I already do. Oh, wow, that is a really good compliment. Thank you. Um, I hope I'm going to pronounce your name correctly. Sujay Rivera says, hello, will you be telling scary Disneyland stories this October? No, but I will. Every October, I take my scary Disneyland videos and I put them back up to the top of the of the front page of my channel. The reason why I'm not going to make any more is because I didn't make those stories up. Th those were real stories. And I was only there for six years, so I have a very limited amount of stories. So I can't make new videos because there's no new stories to tell. So, um, yeah, it's actually kind of funny. I got contacted by a podcaster um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they saw my Haunted Disneyland videos, and which again, if you guys want to see those videos, they're on my channel. You can look them up. It's called Haunted Disneyland. Or you can wait till this October when I put them back up on the front page of the channel, along with some new um, ghost story content. I've actually already filmed stuff to make for this October, so I'm really excited to show you guys that stuff. Um, but uh, yes, so... They contacted me, and they said that they found my videos. They liked my videos. And they wanted me to be a guest on their podcast to talk about my experiences as a cast member at Disneyland for all the various haunted experiences that I experienced there. And then they wanted me to go to some small convention that they were going to do. And talk about things there, live, in front of people. I declined that. And the reason why is because I'm actually not a paranormal enthusiast. Um, I have experienced things that I could only describe as hauntings. I don't experience it that often. I mean, my apartment's not haunted. My last apartment was haunted, but this one isn't. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not something that happens very often to me. But when it does happen, you know, I have a very technical mind. I try to debunk things as they happen, and quite often I can. But then there are some things I can't debunk. And, um, and so, yeah, but while I do have strange paranormal experiences, I'm not a paranormal enthusiast. I don't want to seek out the dead. I don't want to, you know, to see content based on that. I don't really even watch that kind of content. I, I occasionally do watch paranormal content about the Queen Mary, but that's only because those are the only kinds of videos where people actually explore the Queen Mary. Like, I, I like to watch videos where people walk through the Queen Mary and, and have fun. Unfortunately, the majority of those kinds of videos are paranormal videos which is sad, let me just say that, that's really sad. That's a ship with a lot of wonderful history, great stories, and most, the thing that people only care about when it comes to Queen Mary is ghosts. That's sad. Um, but, you know, but, but I'm not a paranormal enthusiast. And so I told this person, I, I was like, you know, thank you so much for inviting me. I was like, but I have no interest in, in talking about it on a podcast or, or, or talking about it in uh, live in front of people because I don't have that same kind of enthusiasm for it as, as those other people do. Um, you know, and, and to be honest, when it comes to the paranormal community as a whole, the, based on the YouTube videos they all have, I don't think it's real. I don't think what they do is real. Just in general, that everybody. There's, there's been one or two channels, like, um, like I watched the, the channel, um, Dan Bell, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, it's not exactly a child-friendly channel, but he occasionally has done, like, paranormal stuff, and I believe his channel, because he doesn't, he's like me, he's not a paranormal enthusiast, so, so, uh, when he has weird experiences. I'm kind of like, okay, all right, I believe that, you know. That's just me.
I lost my place. Oh, here we go. Um, Daniel says, hey, Alex, is Queen Mary next to a U-boat or a submarine in Long Beach? I mean, I wouldn't put it in that order. I'd say a submarine is next to the Queen Mary because that is Queen Mary's lagoon. But the submarine was placed there later. Um, but yes, there is. There's a, a Russian Scorpion submarine it was retired in 1994 um, and was brought to the Queen Mary, I think, in 1998. And it's still there, but it needs to be removed. It's in very bad condition. Very, very bad condition. It's, it's not salvageable, basically. It's that bad of condition. It's just rotten all the way through. So the city wants to get rid of it, but they can't find the owners. And it's an ongoing legal battle right now. So when people tell me and the people are, people are going to comment in after the live stream is over, they're going to be like, oh, well, they could just demolish it. It's an ongoing legal matter. So it has to wait till the legal issue is settled. So, um, Thomas says, for me, I recently got into reaching the Orient Express and like you, I focus on things that I'm interested in at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Um, Granny Gaming says, how long does this tea to make? Um, does this tea take to make? So this Lady Grey, I have found that it takes four minutes at a temperature of about 190 to 195 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how it takes to brew. So yeah, four minutes. If I'm doing like a, if I'm doing like an uh, English breakfast tea, it'll be more like 200 degrees Fahrenheit at five minutes. That's just my personal taste, but. Daniel Ramirez says, hey, Alex, do you have a video about Knott's Berry Farm and its railroads? No, because I, it's not one of those subjects that interests me. Mark Raymond says, I had a history teacher who, or high school history, yeah, high school history teacher who had visual aids for everything he said, best class. Oh, that's always the best, is when they have good visual aids that you can follow along with. Yeah, Jose, I, I know about the Britannic game. I, um, I'm i not interested in that one because um, because of the fact that the way it's designed is if you want to go from one area of the ship to another, you have to, like, you have to, like, I don't know the words for it because I'm not a gamer, but your character has to leave that room and then get plopped into another room. I don't like that. It interrupts the flow. So, um, and then if you want, if you want to experience the thing sinking, which I also don't agree with sinking games, but, um, but, uh, if you want to experience it sinking, you have to like plop out of that version of the game and plop into a different version. So I, I don't like the way it's designed. It's, it interrupts. I don't like that. Um... Eternal Travel says, I saw pictures of the early Mickey and Minnie before we got what they have today. They were creepy. What, like from the 1920s? I didn't think they were creepy. I thought they were kind of cute. Linda Solis says, Hi there, Alex. Every time I see Golden Horseshoe, either in person or in another video, I think of Alex and his ghost stories. The Golden Horseshoe is certainly the most haunted place I've ever been. And I've been to the Queen Mary several times in my life. It, that place, to me, does not feel haunted at all. To me. The Golden Horseshoe at Disneyland, on the other hand, you stay there long enough, you will feel something. It is so haunted there. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> Haley says, watched your haunted Disneyland videos, and they, are, they were awesome. Very interesting. Thank you. Granny Gaming says, early Mickey and Minnie were quite racist. 
that's a whole other subject, and I've talked about it a few times in my channel, but there is a difference between racist and racially insensitive. I know a lot of people blur those lines because they think same difference, but it really isn't. You know, it is possible to be racially insensitive without hating someone's race. And so that's one of those things where Mickey and Minnie fall into it. Mickey and Minnie were put into various cartoons and situations where they were doing things that today are completely unacceptable to watch. But it wasn't because anyone was trying to make fun of or show hatred for a different race. It was because due to cultural insensitivity those kinds of things were thought to be entertaining or in some cases funny it was just part of a trick you or a trick a joke you tell let's not forget that up until a few years ago it it was generally accepted to tell jokes that were also racially insensitive such as like jokes about asian people driving or jokes about um you know Mexican Americans being lazy. Up until a few years ago, it was actually acceptable in general society to tell those kinds of jokes. And those were kind of what I would say the last remnants of racial insensitivity. <clears throat> so, because the person telling the joke is not necessarily a hater, therefore you can't classify them as a racist because racism is something about the hatred for something. But, not something, a, a race, but you know. But so Mickey and Minnie, they did many things that today we would not find acceptable at all. But it was never done to for the purpose of being hurtful. It was done for the sake of getting everyone, everyone in the audience to laugh. We don't laugh at that stuff anymore. So, you know, yeah. One of those ways is, because uh, I know a lot of people are probably going to wonder, what, what is an example of that? Well, there's an episode, a black and white cartoon. I don't remember what it's called, but it's probably named after the thing that happened in the video, which is there was a cartoon where Mickey Mouse and Minnie were going to do a, a live stage show for a bunch of people. And they were going to perform the... A rendition of, um, I think it's called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was a very popular stage show to do for many, many decades, especially up until, you know, the, the end of the Jim Crow laws and all that. But it was popular. Everybody thought it was a popular show, not just white people or whatever. It was, it was generally considered a popular thing, Uncle Tom's Cabin. There's a book about it, I think. Um, but anyway, they were Mickey and Minnie were going to perform this show. The thing about Uncle Tom's Cabin is generally the characters who were all, um, uh, you know, black or African American or whatever you want to call it. And so Mickey and Minnie had to dress up the part, which of course leads to the very unforgivable blackface that they had to put on. And of course, back then. In the context of history, performing in blackface was a generally accepted thing to do because not a lot of theaters allowed black people to perform on stage. So when you had a part that was a black character, quite often the white folks would have to dress up in blackface. It wasn't always done for the sake of being racist. But I would say the act of not letting them be on the stage was the racist part. Um, but anyway, Mickey and Minnie did that performance in blackface. And so I think a lot of people see those images. They don't watch the whole cartoon. They see those images and they think, that is terrible. Mickey and Minnie are, are horrible racist bigots in this cartoon. But if you watch the cartoon, you will notice that the audience is loving the characters that Mickey and Minnie are portraying in this cartoon. And then once the villain of the show comes in, the audience reacts so negatively to that villain. I, I, if I remember the story correctly, this person tries to come and, and take over uh, Uncle Tom's cabin. And everybody in the cartoon audience 
starts throwing stuff at this evil villain, this, you know, this person who wants to get rid of the cabin. And eventually Mickey and Minnie, who are playing the main roles of the characters, you know, they get back the cabin. There's like this happy little ending and everybody cheers for Mickey and Minnie. So it's one of those things where it's awful to look at, but there is context to it, which tells a different story. So, you know, as someone who researches history, I have to also try to be objective and kind of learn both sides of the story and understand what does this actually mean. So... Uh, Conrad says, does your friend Steve have special access to the Queen Mary? No. No, nobody at QMI is directly associated with the Queen Mary. Oh, jeez. I don't personally know anybody, actually, that is directly associated with the Queen Mary. Um, you know, Steve used to work on the Queen Mary. Uh, he was, for many years, a tour guide, and, and he did other special events and other jobs and things on the Queen Mary, especially some restoration work. Um, and I hope I'm remembering everything correctly, but yeah, but you know, today, you know, he's got his own life, his own job, his own thing. So he's not working on the Queen Mary anymore. And so, yeah. Um, so I don't want people to think like, oh, because I know all these people, I'm going to be able to get into the Queen Mary with special, I, I don't know anybody like that. So, um, Let's see. Eastorcon says, Hello there, I'm new to your channel, and just by looking at a couple of videos, you like the Queen Mary and other ocean liners. I really like that, and I just want to say, keep up the good work. Oh, thank you so much. And welcome to the channel, by the way. Tico says, if you could go to any point in time of any ocean liner history, when and where would you go? Any point in time, any ocean liner history? Queen Mary, maiden voyage. Yeah, Queen Mary, maiden voyage. Um, Nicole says, how old are you? I am 30 years old. Turned 30 earlier this year, and I've never gotten over it. Um... Will you do a what if on Wilhelm Guslov? A what if? What is a what if? Um, Nicole says, also, do you do anything with ships for a living? No, not really. Um, I'm, I've only been new to ships for the last two years, so I'm still very new to them and stuff like that. So I, I don't really do any of that. I'm not, I've never had a job that was directly related, well, except for my job at Disneyland. I was a tour guide at Disney for a while. Um, so I guess that is directly related to my Disneyland content, but I don't have any content that is directly related to my interest in ocean liners or, um, no, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have any jobs that are directly related to my love of ocean liners or trains. Um, but the time may be passed for that because I spend all my time doing YouTube videos now. So, um, Justin says, hi, Alex. I filmed the area around the community college I went to and documented was left. What was, wait, documented and documented what was left of the various homes and farms that used to be there before the college was located and built there. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. I have several videos on my channel that are done on the spot with regards to what I know about local history in Western New York, also part of our heritage tourism. Nice. Uh, Jeffrey Charles says, Hey, Alex, do you think now is a good time to buy Disney stock? Honestly, I know nothing about stocks. So I would hate to say yes and then, <laughs> and then give you bad advice. I feel like just guessing, and really this is just a guess, not based off of any information whatsoever. But I would lend a guess that no, it's not a good time. Only because right now the company is undergoing such uncertainty you know the fan base is not happy where things are going 
you know, the society in general is not happy where where things are going with Disney. And then Disney keeps landing in political hot water because they keep getting it. Disney should not be involved in politics. They are a private company. They should not be talking about politics. They should not be putting their hands in politics. So, yeah. But they are, and they do. So here we are. <laughs> so... Uh, so it's that it's the fact that they keep dipping into politics that is making both sides of the political spectrum hate them for it. Of course, they hate them for unrelated reasons to just the fact that they're in politics, but... See, Walt Disney was smart. He didn't... Po he didn't use his company to show political favor. You know, yes, people of various political parties visited Disneyland, but again, they were various political parties. But, um, but he never used his company to show favoritism. And unfortunately, the company does do that nowadays. And that is precisely what is leading to this uncertainty. Mm. Daniel Mary says that one of the things he doesn't love is that most of the videos about Queen Mary on YouTube are about its ghosts. I agree. The Queen Mary has such a fantastic history. I gotta start eating these sandwiches. Um, the Queen Mary has such a fantastic history. It really is a shame that you know, most people, all they care about is ghosts. You know, I had a comment. Someone left a comment. Wonderful comment. They used to work on the Queen Mary. They had such a great time. They learned so much history. Someone responded to that comment. Yes, but is it haunted? And I'm thinking, this person just told a great story about their time working on Queen Mary. A wonderful story. You know multifaceted and the only takeaway this person had to commenting to that story was yes but is there ghosts that's sad you know i i do believe in ghosts i've seen ghosts in other places not on queen mary but in other places but I, but i would never favor ghosts over history i mean then again should i really blame that person i mean some people don't like history. They they like ghosts. Is that really something I should be mad at? I don't know. I don't know. See, this is the kind of philosophical conversation I love to have with you guys. Cat President says, what do you think if RMS Aquitania wasn't scrapped in 1950. Well, she would have been scrapped soon after. Um, didn't she have a really long um, service life? Yeah, because she was 1915. It was 1915, right, that she went into service? To 1950 when she was scrapped? I mean, technically, she was out of service right after the war ended, so she was probably, like, laid up for, like, three years, maybe. Maybe two. So she was never put back in service after the war. But nevertheless, she was around for 35 years. I would have given her another five years if she hadn't been scrapped. Honestly, she was in such bad condition after the Second World War... So she would have really only lasted till like 1955. And most certainly she would have had to be scrapped because by the mid-1950s, nobody would have been taking four stacker, you know, um, ocean liners. You know, for one thing, they were really expensive to operate. They were really old fashioned by then. You know, in... Um, in the video I'm working on currently about the uh, about the um, the French Quarter in New Orleans, 
one I'm actually literally working on at the moment. Well, I'm doing the tea time, but you know what I'm saying. Um, in that video, I'll be talking about there was a time when the French Quarter was not going to survive. And this was in the 1930s. By the 1930s, the French Quarter was seen as this dilapidated slum that nobody wanted. Because it really, it, well, it really was a slum in the 1930s. It was a, it was a complex story, and it's going to be in the video, and I'll explain it in the video. But uh, to summarize without revealing too much before you even get to see the video, um, it was mostly full of impoverished, you know, African Americans. Many of them were, you know, descendants of the slaves that once, you know, occupied the city. You know, and so any gentility, is that a word? <laughs> the genteels, the, you know, when I, any, any, any kind of wealth left the French Quarter. And by the 1930s, it was an impoverished slum. And here comes, you know, all of the wealthy people again coming back in and going, let's destroy the French Quarter and build a new area of the city out of it. So I think people forget that often in history, there are many times where even in the past, even in the 1930s, people didn't want to preserve history. So Aquitania lasting until 1955, that would have been unheard of anyway, because it was such an old ship, you know, by then, in many ways, more than one, you know. So I don't think she would have lasted that long. Tico says, are you going to see the Nomadic in Belfast? Yes. I'm going to see the Nomadic, the Titanic Museum. Um, I want to stay in the Titanic Hotel. I want to see the Titanic Graving Dock. Yeah, that's the four things you can see there. Um, Mark Cooper says, I know you love British tradition, Alex, as I do. Whilst you are not necessarily a car guy, I wonder if you have an admiration for Rolls-Royce motor cars. I have an admiration for the Rolls-Royce cars of the 1930s and stuff, but not that much of an admiration. I don't really know what I'm looking at when I look at them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's hard to describe. I'm, I don't, I don't have a particular understanding of, of, um, of admiration for cars. To me, a car is, is a utility vehicle, much like, you know, much like a pillow is a utility device for when you sleep. I don't have a particular interest in pillows. I know what pillow is comfortable and what works for me. But uh, but I'm the same way with cars. I don't have a particular admiration for cars. I know what's comfortable and what works for me. Um, so yeah, I Rolls Royces from the 1930s do look nice. Um, but I also like other ones from the 1930s. There's some Ford motor cars that look kind of cool. Like, I want, like, okay, I have a neighbor here. I don't know them. I've never met them. But I have a neighbor here somewhere, and they park this old 1930s Ford. Um, beautiful car. I definitely love looking at that car way more than I would love looking at any modern car that's out there today. So I guess to a certain degree, I do have an admiration for cars. But I couldn't tell you what kind of Ford that is or... Or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. KY Cat says, so what are, you, what are you planning for your trip to New Orleans? Um, so for my trip to New Orleans, which might happen in spring, um, what I'm planning is my 
friend Chris is going to go with me. Maybe my father. Um, but that's if he's available. Otherwise, it'll be me and Chris. And we're going to go stay in the French Quarter. So there's a few hotels there that I've kind of bookmarked. I'm not going to say which ones because people will try to mob me. Um, but <clears throat> but um, there are some hotels in the French Quarter I've looked at. I want to stay in an authentically old place. I will say that. I don't want to stay in a modern building. I want to stay in a building that has been around since the 1800s. Um, and my plan is I've been writing down a list of various buildings and structures of interest within the French Quarter that I need to get video footage of both outside and inside, um, especially various museums and things. And then I also plan to get video footage, just ambient video footage of French Quarter in general, walking down the streets and walking up the other streets and things like that. Um, we're also going to take a ride aboard the Natchez, which is the, the only remaining real steamboat on the Mississippi. It is currently undergoing renovations because it caught fire a couple months ago. Um, but eventually it'll be back and we want to ride aboard. I also have plans to visit some plantations out there. Um, everybody has to visit Oak Alley. But there's another plantation I have my eye on called um, Whitney Plantation. And the reason why is because there are plantations like Oak Alley, which are really good at showcasing the artistry of the architecture of the building but Whitney Plantation is preserved as more of a museum and it's a museum dedicated to the slaves that lived on that property so Oak Alley is more about romanticizing the beauty of the structure the last remaining building essentially um, but Whitney Plantation is about teaching you about the horrible lives of the enslaved people. And I want to get both perspectives, you know. I want to... You have to see Oak Alley. You just have to. Um, but Whitney Plantation is one I'm really looking forward to. I want to learn and understand more about what these people went through. Let's not forget that New Orleans was the hub for the slave trade probably the biggest hub in the entire world when it comes to the slave trade. You can't go to New Orleans and ignore that part of its history. And I don't want to ignore it. I want to learn about it. I want to see if there's, if there's stories that I could tell that could reach people's hearts. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that stuff. It's very tragic. It's very sad. Um, but I feel that one of the best ways we can learn from our past is by retelling those stories. And I want to use the, my formula for making videos to telling some of those stories. And so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to visiting the Whitney Plantation because they have a lot of restored buildings, way more than Oak Alley does. They have like all kinds of slaves quarters i think they have a chapel they have just all kinds of industrial buildings that were all used in those in that era and so yeah i'm looking forward to that and um let's see what else in new orleans i talked about taking footage of all the streets and particular buildings i've been writing down i do want to see congo square there might be something to be said about about congo square especially on my channel um, oh, we'll be going to the Garden District briefly. Not spending too much time there, but there's a, there's a lot of um, buildings and things there. There's also uh, Lafayette Cemetery, which is nearby. I want to see that. There's a few other cemeteries and things I want to see. So I want to immerse myself <coughs> in the history of New Orleans. I'm not quite interested in the modern history of New Orleans, but I will be visiting the, the Hurricane Katrina Museum just as a personal thing because I remember I remember following the stories of Hurricane Katrina as they were unfolding in 2005. I was a teenager 
Um, but, you know, seeing all of that and seeing the destruction and the sadness it caused and the deaths and all that, I, I have to see their, their Hurricane Katrina Museum. <clears throat> but um, I will also be taking video footage of the various levees around the city to talk about the engineering of the levees and the pump houses. I'm hoping there's at least one pump house that is a museum that we could walk through. So if anybody knows if New Orleans has a pump house that acts as a museum, I would love to see it because I want to make a video about it. Um, <clears throat> so there's things like that. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so lots of things to see in New Orleans. I know a lot of people go to New Orleans to party, but I'm not a party person. I don't plan to party there. I plan to see all the old structures and stuff. And, you know, I could literally make dozens upon dozens upon dozens of videos off of that trip to New Orleans, just taking all that B-roll footage. Um, and that's exactly what I want to do. I want to make all kinds of videos about the history and engineering of New Orleans. Daniel says, would you rather save Olympic or Aquitania from being scrapped? <clears throat> hmm. Aquitania. And I don't say that easily. Olympic is worthy of being saved because it went through a world war and it is the sister ship to Titanic. So everybody who loves Titanic, if it was saved today, would have had the ability to see its sister ship and, and get that satisfaction of seeing Titanic, but, you know, it would have been Olympic. But I would say, say Aquitania instead. And the reason why <clears throat> is because Aquitania went through two world wars. And, um, you know, Aquitania was a very influential ship on the Cunard Company. So I would say Aquitania, but only because it's been through two world wars and there's a lot to learn from it. I think if Britannic survived World War One, I, I think Britannic would have been scrapped alongside Olympic in 1935. And the reason why is because it wasn't the ships weren't the two ships, you know, Olympic and Mauritania and stuff. They weren't scrapped just because they were old. They were scrapped because they were outdated and they were expensive to operate because they were old. Um. So Olympic, or so Britannic would have faced the same fate as Olympic. Britannic would have been, you know, two years newer than Olympic. But ultimately, that doesn't matter. Britannic had the same type of engine, same type of propulsion system and boilers. It would have been too expensive to keep operating. It would have just, you know, made things worse for the company. So it would have been scrapped at the same time. KY Cats, have you ever heard of Madame Delphine LaLaurie? Yes, indeed. Uh, I want to film right outside the LaLaurie mansion. The only thing is that <clears throat> it's a private residence today, so I don't want to, like, upset anybody, but I, I do plan to film outside the LaLaurie mansion so I can tell that story in a future Halloween episode. Of course, that'll be Halloween of 2023, but still, it'll make for a really good Halloween video. 
<clears throat> Let's see. Linda says, that sounds fascinating, Alex. I hope you can do a video on the slaves trade in a way that shows the horrible history so that people can learn from the past. NOLA is a bucket list place for me. Yeah, you know, it's it's a bucket list place for me, too. Um, and yeah, I do want to talk about the slave trade and do it in a way that, you know, that people can learn and, and appreciate at least the severity of what has happened, you know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, when you think about it, people today, they love the French Quarter. It's a beautiful, wonderful corner of the city. And, but I think it's also important to remember that the French Quarter wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the bloodshed that took place to make it a reality. You know, not just the wars that happened, you know, and the takeovers, but also the slave trade. And so... <clears throat> so I think, like, it would be good to make some videos about that and do it in a way that <clears throat> that tells the story without leaving the viewer feeling hopeless, you know? Because I think sometimes those kinds of stories can leave you at the very end feeling drained and feeling hopeless and feeling like... I mean, there's a reason why people don't watch that kind of content that much, and it's because it makes people uncomfortable to watch. But sometimes we have to learn things that are uncomfortable to learn, you know? So um, I would like to make a video and try my hand at it and see if I can make something that that helps you to understand these things without feeling uncomfortable at the very end. So that'd be kind of something I want to try out. <clears throat> Nicholas, thank you so much. Uh, if the QE2 or Canberra had gotten into an old-fashioned 18th century style ramming machine with the Argentinian Navy, what would have been the outcome? That is a really complex question, and I don't even know what half of those things are. I don't know what the Canberra or an 18th century ramming machine is. And the Argentinian Navy, I have no idea their story. I could not answer your question. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Remember, I've only been interested in ships for two years. It's not been a long time at all. Um, Pierre says, hello from Montreal, Canada. Awesome. Hello. KY Cat says, same here. I'd love to walk through the city. The culture that developed from the slave trade along with immigration is absolutely fascinating and unique. The social structure that developed there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and so not only do I want to talk about the history, but I want to talk about the history of the engineering of the city. You know, I want to talk about the levees, the pump houses, the architecture of the city. You know, there's various architecture in there. And it was all built for various reasons. And I want to talk about, like, the condition of the city today and and why the French Quarter looks like the way it does today. And there's lots of, lots of like, stories, like, almost unlimited amounts of stories that I could, I could make from that, uh, from that trip. So I'm excited. Because um, that's what I do. I go somewhere, I film it. And then I can make tons of videos off of it because as I learn more about that subject, I have the B-roll footage to cover it. Um, uh, Peyton says, curious about why the bridge of Aquitania changed so many times. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to say I don't know. Because I did notice that I had a different painting hanging here. It was one that my friend gave me. Um, unfortunately, it covers up the first power outlet on this wall. So I need that power outlet today so I couldn't put the painting up. But um, the painting is of the Aquitania, and I noticed it had a different... A different bridge than what I've seen. And that's when I kind of discovered that it had various different bridges over the years, but I don't know why. Uh, 
Daniel asks a very interesting, but I think complex question. Hey, Alex, do you believe that the old train and ocean liners are similar? Because whenever there was a new design of locomotive, a design more older would called f useless because of its age. Oh, am I? Oh, is it? Are you asking? Are ocean liners and and old trains similar because as they age, people call them outdated and useless? I would say yeah, but that that goes for anything, honestly. Um, any anything that we use on a on a you know daily basis, as soon as it becomes old and outdated, we call it old and outdated. I mean that's that goes with anything, honestly. It doesn't necessarily mean that trains and ocean liners are so similar. But, I mean, you know, one could say that the steam, the steam trains that carried people to the ocean liner docks had disappeared at just about the same time that steam-powered ocean liners were starting to disappear. Or ocean liners in general were starting to disappear. You know, by the time QE2 had launched, you know, everybody was using diesel trains. So, yeah. Transit Biker says, how's the temperature today there? Today we have a temperature of about 101 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Thankfully, I have my new air conditioner. It's only about 77 degrees Fahrenheit in here. So it's a very nice, comfortable temperature in here. Oliver says, as a Brit, I'm very interested in all aspects of history, even stuff like the British Empire. Many people suffered and died under imperial rule, but I don't feel uncomfortable learning about it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of amazing stories to tell about that. You know, like, I would love to... <laughs> I would love to visit India someday. And I say that with hesitancy because there's a lot of political stuff going on right now between the United States and India. Um, but also because, uh, you know, India is a very different country. I would need a, a guide who could, you know, who could kind of take me around and show me the things I need to see and help me to navigate the culture. Um, but, you know, I would love to go to India and make stories, not make stories, man, <laughs> film to make videos about the development of India, especially under, under the British rule and how it changed the Indian culture and especially how things were managed after uh, India gained its independence. So, I would love to go to India and film something like that. My friend Chris has already said that if I go to India, he'll go with me. So that's actually kind of cool. I won't have to go alone. Um, so yeah, that that's something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, but I don't know when I'll go to India. It might be a couple of years from now. It might be, who knows, maybe 2025 or something. We'll see. Cat President, I think it's the second time you asked if I could make a what if video on Wilhelm Gustloff. I don't know what you mean by what if video. Like, what am I supposed to be asking? What if what? PDR Studio says collab with Ocean Liner design when? I don't know. I, I suppose when the time suits the need, I, I suppose. Cat President says, what's your favorite food? My favorite food is...
crawfish etouffee. Um, I've always been particularly fond of of um, both Creole and Cajun cuisine. Um, crawfish etouffee falls under the Creole cuisine. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, um, I've always been fond of that kind of food. And there was a time in my past, you know, when I was fresh out of culinary school where I was considering trying to open a place that would sell, um, New Orleans, you know, regional food. But ultimately I decided against it. It's a lot of work. Um, but yeah, so I love crawfish etouffee. Um, Daniel says, hey Alex, was there ever a boiler explosion on a ship? Oh yeah, most definitely. It happened a lot. Um, I mean, one of the first things that comes to mind is there was a, a boiler explosion on the let's see was it yeah ss france of 1910 there was a boiler explosion on on ss france of 1960 there was a boiler explosion on the qe2 so yeah there's been a quite a few boiler explosions over time Transit Biker says, Aquitania was overhauled at least twice for wartime service. It seems based on the dry dock dates. Yes, indeed. Hello, Mike. Haley says, what are your thoughts on the India scene? It's a small world. I'm trying to remember. Is there an India scene and it's a small world? I remember there is... Um, there's a scene in, of the Middle East, but I don't recall what part of the Middle East. There's a scene of Thailand, and the next to Thailand is China. I don't recall India. Um... Nikolaus says, Falklands War, 1982, Argentinian Navy versus Royal Navy, QE2 and Canberra were utilized heavily to land Gurkha soldiers. Wondered if the QE2 and Canberra were both capable of cutting Argentine destroyers in two in a ramming fight. Oh. I see now. Okay. Okay. I did do a little bit of research on the Falklands War. Um, I don't know about Canberra, because I didn't do much research on Canberra. QE2, could it have been capable of cutting an Argentine destroyer in two? Yes, but there would have been a lot of damage. A lot of damage. I mean, you think Queen Mary's damage when it cut that cruiser in half was a lot? It'll be way more on QE2, but yes, it could happen. Or, or could have, you know, been done. But I don't think anybody ever really looks to try to do that much kind of damage to a destroyer. You know, um, Olympic sliced a U-boat in half. But that's a U-boat. U-boats back then were really tiny. You know, Olympic could handle it. But QE2 was not built to the same strength standards as Queen Mary. And a destroyer is far more tough and larger than a U-boat, or as than they were back in, you know, in the First World War, at least. So, I mean, yes, it could be done, I think, but I don't think there would have been salvaging of QE2 after that. It would have limped back to a port and probably been too expensive to overhaul. Maybe. Um... So, yeah. But anyway, thank you for the donation again, Nikolaus. Cat President says, Will you please do a story on the custom ocean liner SS Romania? Because if you do, I'll send the designs. I I mean, I, I, I don't really... 
take suggestions. I do have a year's worth of videos to make, so I wouldn't even be able to reach it till a year from now. And that's if I find the story interesting. So, yeah, I it's it, it's really hard. But you see, this is what happens. People ask me, can you do a video on this? And then a bunch of other people come in and ask, can you do a video on this and a video on that and a video on that? I, I can't. I can't do a video on all that stuff. Um, Conrad says, crawfish and creole. Now we know why you want to visit New Orleans. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, we're definitely going to be eating a lot. A lot of southern food in New Orleans. That's for sure. Gabe Wilson says, Hey, Alex, I got a PC for my birthday on August 4th. Awesome. Daniel says, Do you think Walt Disney is a controversial figure because people think he's racist? Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. I, de I think, definitely think that, that people think he's a controversial figure. Transit Biker says, Lots of American riverboats had boiler explosions due to corrosion from coal, wood, contaminated sediment, and water, as well as their sheer number of boats in service at any given time. Yep, that's that's true. Heli says, India is represented in the ride with Taj Mahal, a snake charmer, veiled dancer, is a tightrope dancer, and a... Oh, that's right, that's what that... My, that's what that thing is, is the Taj Mahal. That's right. And your question was, what do I think of the India scene? Yeah, what are your thoughts on the India scene? It's a beautiful scene. I'm, I'm not really sure what, um, what else I could say. It's a beautiful scene. I've always loved that scene. All right. See you later, Oliver. I'm going to finish this real quick. I'm going to reheat some of this tea. Justin says, The Aquitania continued to sail after World War II on austerity and troop rep 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 repatriation runs through the end of 1949. Oh, I see. Okay, so it wasn't just left for two years to sit. Okay. Tyler says, make sure you have a good time at the barbecue in New Orleans. <laughs> Thanks. Modcat says, is Titanic 2 be an ocean liner? Well, first of all, no. Titanic 2 it was going to be designed as a cruise ship, so it wouldn't have been as strong or as fast as the, as the original Titanic would have been, and it wouldn't have been designed for the same purposes as the original Titanic. Um, but also, Titanic 2 is canceled. It was canceled last year, so it's not going to be made. Um... Dan Ramirez says, did any ships sink because of boiler explosions? Yes, but off the top of my head, I can't recall. Um, but yeah, it did happen. Gabe Wilson says, hey, Alex, what would happen if the Titanic never sank or Britannic? Just wondering. Yeah, Gabe, we were actually talking earlier in the live stream about how that's one of the questions that I'm frequently asked all the time. What would happen if the Titanic never sank or Britannic never sank? Yeah, I all I can tell you is the same is the same answer I always give everybody. I really don't know and I really couldn't I I don't usually try to talk about Titanic or the Olympic class ships if I can avoid it because of the fact that um <clears throat> because of the fact that you know, so many people have ideas of what they think is true and what they think is not true. And when I try to discuss these things, um, they usually don't like what I have to say about it. Not that you won't like what I have to say about it, but I'm going to get a lot of comments later with people telling me that uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, but I mean, all I can tell you is I don't think the world would have changed that much. Really, I don't. I don't think the world would have changed that much. I think that um, things would have continued to go on, and today would have been just like today. Um, all right. More sugar.
Mr. PH30 says Bangladesh has a number of river cruises and tea plantations. So good chances you could get to pick your own tea there. Oh, nice. Justin says, I'm glad the second Titanic was canceled. It's extremely bad taste and offensive to the lives lost on that date. And for those that survived who had to carry on those memories, I agree. I don't understand why he couldn't have just tried to remake Olympic. That would have been less offensive, you know. He could have tried to remake Olympic and put a little Titanic museum on the Olympic. That would have gone over well, much better with people. Um, but he didn't. He wanted to recreate Titanic, and I, I found that offensive. We all know. No one here would would disagree with me when I say the only reason Titanic is famous is because it sank. So if you're rebuilding Titanic and you're going to use it as a cruise ship, don't pretend you're rebuilding it for some kind of, you know, some kind of nostalgia or, or, or whatever. You're rebuilding it, and the reason why it's offensive is because it was a ship that sank. It, it sank in this horrific way and killed lots of people when it happened. And you're rebuilding it because you're hoping to make money and, you know, bank off of that nostalgia for the tragedy. It's the same thing with games that that show, you know, Titanic sinking. I mean, I know Titanic Honor and Glory is going to be one of those games. That's one of those things where I'm actually, I've actually got two opinions on it. One half of me is kind of upset. I'm like, geez, they're going to make it sink. And I think that's so distasteful. But the other thing too, is that they're the only people that are recreating Titanic in such a detailed format. And the way they're going to do it is you'll be able to pick up objects or go through rooms and learn about those things. They're going to have information on all that stuff. So you can learn about the architecture, about the stories, about the people aboard the ship. So while they are doing a sinking version eventually, which again, I don't agree with, at least the rest of the ship will be a learning opportunity. And... So, therefore, I'm not so against Titanic Honor and Glory for that reason. But I was very much against the Titanic 2 cruise ship before it was cancelled. That was just pure offensiveness, you know? So... <clears throat> Which one do you... Oh, I see, I see. Mr. PhD says, out of the various transatlantic ships like Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, Titanic... Where is it? Um, Etc. Which one do you think had the best value for money for the guests? Well, it certainly wasn't Titanic. <laughs> It would have definitely been Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth. Best value for money. I'm gonna have to lean more Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. And the reason why not Titanic is because let's everybody remember Titanic was 24 years before Queen Mary and 28 years before Queen Elizabeth. In that time, they improved the guest experience aboard an ocean liner. So Queen Elizabeth 
had a lot more luxury than Titanic ever had. Queen Elizabeth was, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary were far more luxurious than Titanic. Now, that's a given because as time goes on, you know, industries adapt the amount of luxury that people want for the given era. You know, so, um, so yeah, Queen Elizabeth was far more luxurious and now, the funny thing is, is would I say Queen Elizabeth is more luxurious than Queen Mary? I'd say they're both about the same. They have trade-offs. But I would say Queen Elizabeth was probably more, more worth people's money. It was probably more bang for their buck, as we say in the U.S. Um, because Queen Elizabeth had way more space on the inside. She only had two funnel shafts as opposed to Queen Mary's three funnel shafts. So there was actually more interior space. More space is always better on a ship, honestly. Um, and Queen Elizabeth had a much better designed cinema aboard for its first class passengers. Queen Mary had a cinema later on in the years, but it, I didn't like Queen Mary's cinema. It doesn't look good. Um, but Queen Elizabeth had a nice cinema. So, I mean, it's for little things like that that I would just slightly move the the arrow closer to Queen Elizabeth. Um, all right, hold on. I'll get to your guys' comments in just a second. Um, Daniel says, hey, Alex, I just realized my grandpa was born on the same year Queen Mary was built. 1930? That's pretty cool. <clears throat> Cat President says, SS Tyrannic, just like the Aquitania, built in 1916, being scrapped in 1958 at 42 years old. Oh, wow. Eternal Travels asks... For some reason, I can't remember what second class was renamed to after World War II on Queen Mary. On um, After World War II, second class, which was previously known as tourist class, was renamed to cabin class. And then third class, which was always third class, was then renamed to tourist class after the war. So, it, so after the war, it was... First class, cabin class, tourist. Tyler, um... There are certain things that people ask me that I cannot respond to because ultimately my channel's not here to ridicule people. It's not here to put people down. My channel is here to encourage people to be the best version of themselves and to encourage people to learn. Um, I don't ever want to be the person who goes out there and literally is putting down whole groups of people for not being like me. And so things like that, I don't respond to questions like that. Um, Haley says, all of the countries represented in the Asia room and it's a small world are Russia, Greece, unspecified Arabic countries, Israel, India, Bali, which is also Indonesia, Thailand, Korea, China, and Japan. Yes, indeed. Nicholas, Nicol, Nicholas, I'm sorry, says, how much Cold War era spying took place aboard the original Queen Mary, Elizabeth, SS United States, America, SS France, and QE2?
I don't think any, because Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, United States, America, SS France, QE2. Well, QE2 is actually more likely to be the one to do the spying. But the other, well, and SS France maybe, but, but the others, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, SS United States, SS America, they, they didn't go anywhere near Russia. They only went the transatlantic crossing. So I don't see them having any reason to do spying on Russia. Is it possible? Yes. Do I know anything about it? No, I've, I've never heard of anything like that. I've never heard of SS France or QE2 being involved in spying operations. So I don't think it happened. I think if it did, there'd be a lot more information on it today. But thank you for your um, donation again. Modcat says, will Queen Mary 2 retire? Well, eventually. Every ship has to retire eventually. Um, the only question is when. I don't think QE2 will retire anytime soon. It'll be a couple decades from now. Fallon Will says, Alex was the SS Louise, which I'm guessing you're asking Princess Louise. Was the SS Princess Louise bigger than Titanic? No. Titanic was far larger than SS Princess Louise. Maroon says, hey, I just got my new PC and I'm seriously ready to explore the Titanic tonight. Awesome. Yeah, I hope you have fun. That's going to be really great. I remember the first time I, I explored the Titanic demo. It was so fascinating. Um, Daniel Ramirez says, Hey, Alex, last week I blew a whistle on Hudson Steam Locomotive. Oh, nice. That's always got to be fun. All right. What time is it? 6 p.m.? All right. I'm going to end the live stream right here, you guys. Because it's been two hours. And I should continue working on videos. <sighs> I took such a break off of making videos due to the heat wave, due to, due to stress and all that stuff. So I have to get back into the flow and continue making videos for you guys. So... I was hoping there will be a video Tuesday, but it might not. I might have to do a special live stream on Tuesday. Let me know. What kind of live stream should I do, you guys, on Tuesday? Put it in the chat. Or put it in the comments if you're watching later on. What kind of live stream do you want to see me do on Tuesday? And on Friday, maybe I'll have a video out for you guys. Um, once again, the video I'm working on currently is about the French Quarter in New Orleans. And then right afterwards, I'll get back into, into Ocean Liners... I'll eventually work on a Spruce Goose video as well. Um, all right. Um, 602. Took me two minutes to say that. Hmm. Beware of the loop guru. I have no idea what that is. There's no updates on Queen Mary, just so you guys know. There's no updates. Modcat says Costa Concordia. I don't, what? <laughs> Alright, you guys. I'm going to end the live stream now. A stream that's about lost ships that sank. Interesting. Okay, I'll think about that. That's a good one. All right, you guys, I'll end the live stream right here. Keep putting your comments in the comment section if you have any ideas about Tuesday live stream. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.